Well, my plan this morning is to, to break the mold of the standard Baptist three-point sermon. And I'm going to push the envelope this morning with not four or five or even uh, six points, but I'm going to preach a sermon uh, with a perfect number of points this morning, uh, namely seven. Now, before you to sort of look for the, the shortest path to the, the exit of your lounge this morning, let me assure you that they will be seven uh, brief points and hopefully very practical points as we uh, study this very well-known portion of Scripture. This is without doubt one of the most famous and well-known stories in all of the Bible. You can ask most young children, most old people, you can even ask most non-Christians, and they will know the story about David and Goliath. The story about the, the bravery and the courage of a, a young shepherd boy against the, the might and the military prowess of the Philistine giant. And over the years, we've been told that, that this is a story about facing the giants in your life. This is a story about human courage, a story about how good always triumphs over evil. In our world of, of obsession with self-esteem and, and success, we are told that just like David, there is a hero. If you look inside yourself and if you just believe in yourself, you will find the inner strength to be able to face the Goliaths in your life. And I think when many people hear or read the story of David and Goliath and they want to understand what it means, they, they don't go to a, a good theological commentary, they turn to the well-known singer Mariah Carey for the answer. There's a hero if you look inside your heart and you don't have to be afraid of what you are. And there's an answer if you reach into your soul and the sorrow that you know will melt away. And then a hero comes along with the strength to carry on and you cast your fears aside because you know you can survive. So when you feel like hope is gone, just look inside you and be strong and you'll finally see the truth that a hero lies in you. Well, for most people, the biblical story has been reworked into the philosophy of our modern thinking. And, and so I think we miss what the Bible is actually trying to teach us about God in this story. So I hope that for some of you at least today, we'll be able to redeem uh, David and Goliath from the Mariah Carey version uh, and to consider the wonderful truths of what uh, is contained in God's word. So we're going to spend our time this morning considering this passage, and I, I want to propose that the overall theme of this chapter is that of faith in God. I guess if we wanted to pick up on a, on a recurring theme throughout the book of 1 Samuel, it, it would be something to do with faith in a faithless world. We saw this in the life of Samuel as we considered him and uh, his mother Hannah in the first couple chapters of Samuel. We've seen the opposite in the lives of the people of Israel and in the life of, of the first king Saul uh, in the last few chapters. But today we come to see this theme return again uh, in the account of David and Goliath. And we don't have time to go through the, the whole passage in detail today. And so what I want us to do is to look at this passage by following the various things which David says in this chapter. And you may have guessed it from the number of points that David speaks seven times in this chapter. And each time he speaks, he reveals something to us about what it means and what it looks like very practically to have true faith in God. Just one last thing by way of introduction, um, and that is, well, why should this matter to me? Uh, why should this story from a Bible that we were all taught as children, why should this really matter to me? Well, because faith matters. Faith, according to the Bible, as we, we read earlier, is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is the, the starting point in our lives as Christians, and it is the fuel that keeps us in Christ during all the days of our lives, and it is the basis for our future hope in 
the Lord Jesus Christ and his second coming and all of eternity. But faith, you see, is not some magical, mystical thing uh, which some Christians have and others don't. Faith is not about believing in yourself. It's, it's not about having a, a kind of subjective spiritual experience. Faith is being sure of what we hope for because faith is based on the revelation of God himself to us in the scriptures. I often hear Christians speaking about faith and they will say things like this, you know, you must just believe. You must just have faith and, and it'll all work out in the end. And sometimes I understand what they mean, but, but I think as Christians, we need to be more specific in the way that we think and the way that we speak about faith. When we speak of faith, it should never be spoken of as, as some kind of abstract or subjective thing. No, true faith is a clear understanding of who God is and our unwavering commitment to, to trust in Him and in His unchanging character. Faith is not subjective, it's objective. Because the object of our faith must always be and can only be the God who is revealed to us in the pages of Scripture. So let's move on to our passage this morning and to look at the seven statements of David and what they teach us about having a true faith in God. And so in the first place this morning, I want us to see that true faith in God is motivated by the glory of God. And we have to jump down to verse 26 to find the first occasion when David speaks. And actually, this is the first time in the whole Bible that David speaks, and it certainly won't be the last. But isn't it appropriate that the very first words of David recorded for us in the scriptures are words which show us that this man is a man whose faith in God is motivated by the glory of God. In actual fact, this must be the first test of anyone who claims to have faith in God. What is the reason for your faith? What is motivating your faith? Is it to get something out of this religion called Christianity? Or is your faith motivated by a desire to see God glorified? Look at verse 26. David has been sent by his dad um, to go and check on his brothers as they face the battle against the Philistines. It's been 40 days that the Israelites stood uh, in fear and trembling before Goliath. And David goes and sees what's taking place on the battlefield. Look at verse 26. David spoke to the men who were standing with him. What will be done for the man who kills that Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Just who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I just love this. Here is Saul and all his mighty warriors running away from Goliath day after day with their tails between their legs. And along comes this young shepherd boy, David. And his first recorded words are, who is this uncircumcised barbarian that he can even dare to defy the army of the living God? Who does this brute think that he is? He's got no clue who he is dealing with, namely the living God of the Bible. And so really this statement of David sets the, the whole tone for the chapter. This chapter is not about a, a shepherd boy or a mighty giant. It's a chapter that is all about the one true living God and what it means to believe in him. And so as we, we think about this first point practically, when you are sick, perhaps with, with cancer or, or the coronavirus, what is the motivation of your prayers for God to heal you? Is it so that you will live longer in order to enjoy life and pursue your career and accomplish your goals? 
so that your life perhaps won't be plagued with pain and suffering any longer? Or is it so that God would heal you in order to be most glorified in and through your life and your service of him? When you are struggling, perhaps financially, or facing unemployment as many are at the moment, what is the motivation for your faith in God to meet your needs? Is it so that you can have lots of money to spend on yourself and enjoy the comforts of this life? Or is it that God would meet your needs so that you can glorify him through your generosity to others and through the work of his kingdom? You see, true faith in God is always motivated by a concern for the glory of God. That his name may be made great in and through my life, irrespective of my circumstances. Then secondly, true faith in God is, is not detracted by opposition. And we see this in verse 29. Now, the development of the events here is, is very typical. No sooner has David expressed these profound words of concern for the glory of God's name that he meets with opposition. And it was opposition from very close quarters. His own older brother, Eliab, the one whom Samuel had wanted to anoint as king in the previous chapter. And often what you will find in the Christian life is that opposition to our faith comes from our close family uh, and friends. 1 Samuel 17, 28 says this, David's oldest brother Eliab listened as he spoke to the men and he became angry with him. Why did you come down here, he asked. Who did you leave those few sheep with in the wilderness? I know your arrogance and your evil heart. You came down to see the battle. I think someone is feeling a little bit threatened by his younger brother. And Eliab cannot handle to, to see the faith of his youngest brother being expressed publicly before the soldiers. And so he, he lashes out at David in a scathing personal attack on David's actions and David's character. And he gets quite nasty and, and personal with David. But notice David's second recorded speech. David won't let himself be distracted by this opposition. And so we read in verse 29, What have I done now? protested David. It was just a question. Then he turned from those beside him to others in front of him and asked about the offer. The people gave him the same offer as before. David doesn't retaliate. He, he doesn't launch a, a counterattack on his brother. He simply asks the question and then moves on with what he had set in his heart to do for God. David would not allow his, his older brother to detract from his attention and from his motivation to please God, to see God being glorified in this desperate situation. And so he keeps the, the glory of God always before him and does not allow anything to draw him away from that which is ultimately most important. And again, as we think about applying the second point to ourselves this morning, how often don't we try to defend ourselves or retaliate or, or justify instead of leaving the opposition to God and focusing on what God has given us to do. Focus on the works of faith which we know will glorify God. And then in the third place, we see that true faith in God is not self-serving in verse 32. And, and this is something that we see very little of today. When you hear today in Christian circles about faith, particularly as you may uh, watch YouTube or certain television channels, the emphasis and, and the, the goal of faith is usually so that you will get personal benefit from it. Is that not true? Things like believe in Jesus and he will make you rich. Have faith in God and he will heal you. Trust in Jesus and, and he will give you all the, the wants of your life. 
In other words, the motivation for faith and, and exercising faith is not the glory of God, it's not the praise of God, it's not the service of God, but it's the, the praise and the glory and the service of self. It's a selfish faith. But David's attitude shows us something very different about true faith. It, he shows us that rightly motivated faith is always a servant of God, firstly, and then a servant of God's people. Verse 32, David said to Saul, don't let anyone be discouraged by him, by Goliath. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. And here we see this, this young shepherd boy standing before the king of Israel. And he says, I'm going to put my life in danger. I will act in accordance with my faith in God so that you and the people of God will not be discouraged, will, will benefit. David's faith here was not self-serving. It was motivated by the glory of God and the service of God's people. And again, how much of our thinking around faith and our desire to have a greater faith in God is motivated by considering the benefit of others. How much do I really desire to have great faith in God so that God can use me the way that he wants to use me in the service of the gospel? I think it's often the case that Christians actually don't want this kind of true greater faith because they are scared of the consequences of where that faith in God might lead them to serve God. And just on this point, please tune in tomorrow morning uh, to Andy Abbott as he leads us in our next devotion in the book of James and as he addresses this very point of having a faith in God which leads us to serve God in whatever way God may choose. In the fourth place, then, uh, we learn from this passage that true faith in God is rooted in God's faithfulness. We see this in verses 34 to 37. Now, in verse 33, we find that King Saul responds to David's previous words about going out to fight Goliath. And notice what Saul says in verse 33. Saul replied, you can't go fight this Philistine. You're just a youth, and he has been a warrior since he was young. So Saul now also opposes David, but not with the kind of unkind character attack like Eliab had done, but rather with the force of persuasive logic and human experience and understanding. The ESV translates this verse like this, you are not able to go and fight this Philistine, says Saul, because you're only a boy. And he's a mighty warrior. He's been fighting wars for longer than you've been alive, David. It makes no sense. Now here we really see the heart of David's faith in God. In the midst of this opposition, in the midst of all this human logic and reasoning, we find that David boldly defends his faith in God because his faith is rooted in in the character of God. It's rooted in God's faithfulness. So David responds to Saul by saying in verse 34 that he has killed bears, he's killed lions, he's killed all these wild animals that have threatened his father's sheep. But that is not what qualifies him to go and fight against this giant. What qualifies him is his theology of who God is. That's what qualifies him to go out and fight Goliath. Look at verse 37. Then David said, The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will also rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. David's faith was rooted in God. It was rooted in the fact that God had always delivered him in the past and God would deliver him again. There was nothing here of a, of a kind of self-centeredness in his confidence or a human pride or boasting. It was a boldness based on his personal understanding of the faithfulness of God in his life up to this point. 
And again, this was a, a real challenge to, to much of our thinking about faith, isn't it? When, when the odds are stacked up against us and the task before us seems logically impossible. And our faith starts to waver and we start to doubt. Where should we be looking? Should we be looking deep down inside ourselves? Of course not. We should be looking to God who is our rock, our refuge and our shelter from the storm. The God who, as we read in Psalm 65, calms the roaring waves with the spoken word. The God who is the same yesterday, today and forever. A God who has never, ever failed on a single promise to a single one of his children ever. A God who has proved to be the faithful one, the covenant-keeping God ever since the creation of the world. He is still God and he will still deliver his people and he will still do what is necessary for our good and for his glory, period. Fifthly then, we learn that true faith in God is not reliant on man's schemes in verses 38 to 40. And I need to say that this point particularly struck me in my preparation this week. How often do we not say, Lord, I believe you are God. I believe you are sovereign and good and powerful. Lord, I know that you know all things. But Lord, I, I'm not quite sure if you can handle this thing in my life. Lord, I think you might need some help from me on this one. Now we might not say those exact words out loud, but we express those thoughts by the way that we tend, tend to take matters into our own hands. When we take on responsibilities and, and cares and worries and control of things which God has not given us to carry. In verse 37, we find that Saul agrees to go along with David's plan of faith, but he feels that God needs some help. And so he loads David with all of his armor. And I'm sure that you can imagine in your mind what David must have looked like as he stood half drowning in Saul's oversized armor. And so David politely removes all these helps from Saul and proceeds with his total trust in God to deliver him. Now, we must notice here that faith in God does not mean that we do not make preparation or that we do not use the means that God has given to us. It doesn't mean, for example, that we just leave our keys in the car with the engine running when we pop into the pick and pay to get our groceries, uh, trusting that God will keep our car safe. No, we, we use those things that God has given to us and we apply biblical wisdom in these situations, realizing that throughout the, the practical use of these things that God has given to us, they themselves are not what keeps us safe or our cars safe or our homes safe, but it is the faithfulness of God in and through those things. It is only God who ultimately saves and protects and provides. And so we see that, that David is not presuming on God here in a kind of proud or, or arrogant way by taking off Saul's armor. But look at what he does. He, he sticks, to, know, uh, he sticks to, to that which he knows God has gifted him in. Those resources that God has given to David. And so he goes to the stream and he picks up five stones and he heads off with his slingshot. He didn't go and face Goliath empty-handed. He didn't even decide to maybe only take one stone. He, he was well prepared, but he never used that preparation as a crutch to, to somehow compensate for the, the weakness or the inadequacies of God, but rather only as a tool to be ready and available to be used by God as and when God chose to do so. So David was prepared in his faith in God, 
but he was not reliant on the schemes of man. And then the second last thing that we, we learn from this passage is that true faith is, is energized by God's power. Verse 45 to, to 47. And here we come to, to the most exciting part of the story. This is the, the showdown between David and Goliath. And we find in verse 43 that Goliath is furious when he sees David. He, he mocks him and he curses him and invites him to, to step over so that Saul can turn him into vulture food. And so this is where the rubber hits the road for David and his faith. There's, there's no turning back now. It's, it's all or nothing at this point. And so let us consider together David's. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with a sword, spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies, the God of the ranks of Israel. You have defied him. Today, the Lord will hand you over to me. Today, I'll strike you down, remove your head, and give the corpses of the Philistine camp to the birds of the sky and the wild creatures of the earth. Then all the world will know that Israel has a God, and this whole assembly will know that it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. He will hand you over to us. Isn't that just fantastic? David doesn't rely on his previous experience at killing lions or his crack shot sling ability to shoot stones. He boldly announces to Goliath that his weapon is the name of the Lord Almighty. And as we saw earlier, David was motivated by the glory of the Lord and he's now energized by God's power at work within him. And he's not wanting to take any glory for himself. God must get the credit. He must be made more and we must be made less. Now sure, David realized that that he was God's instrument in this, that God's purposes in this world is that he chooses to do much of his work through weak humans like you and me. We are the instruments, yes, but God gives the power. God is the one who enables, and so God gets all the glory. So often we lack the faith we need to do what God wants us to do. So often we feel that we have no energy for the work that God has given us to do. Well, perhaps it is because we are not seeking God's glory as the ultimate goal. David wanted that brute of a Philistine to know without any doubt that the Lord Almighty will not let his name be profaned without consequence. Just before his imminent and permanent blackout, David wanted Goliath to know that the glory of Yahweh was at stake and the Lord would vindicate himself. And so lastly, and with this I will close, I want us to see from this passage that true faith in God is always focused on Jesus Christ. In verse 58, now, this point is perhaps a little less obvious than the others, but it comes from the, the seventh and the final time in which David speaks in this chapter. When we used to live in the UK uh, during the time of my theological studies, we, we helped out at a local church to run their holiday club. And the theme of the whole week was looking for clues that point to Jesus. And the kids were taught throughout the holiday club that the whole Old Testament is full of clues which point us to Jesus. Well, we have one of those clues in this passage today. After the, the great victory which the Israelites won over the Philistines on that day, Saul is totally amazed by this young man, David. He knew that he was only a shepherd boy. He had benefited from his soothing music in the palace, but he wanted to know more. He wanted to know who this boy's father was. What was 
David's pedigree. Surely he must come from a, a line of, of great warriors. And so he asks the question directly to David in verse 58. Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. And there, in David's answer, we have a clue which points us to Jesus. Because we know that when we get to the New Testament, that the gospel writers are at great pains to point out to us in their genealogies that Jesus Christ the Messiah was the great, great, great grandson of God's servant Jesse of Bethlehem. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, he wants us to see this connection between Jesus and David. And so he quotes from Isaiah in Romans chapter 15, verse 12. And he says, again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations, and the Gentiles will hope in him. Now, when Isaiah wrote those words, the root of Jesse, the, the offspring of Jesse, David, was long dead and buried. But Isaiah was not speaking about David. He was speaking about David's greatest son, the root of Jesse, who would rise to rule over the nations and people from all nations and tribes and tongues would come and would put their hope in him. Hebrews 11, that great chapter of faith in the Bible that we read from earlier today. The writer in Hebrews 11 includes David in the long list of all the great heroes of the Bible and, and the wonderful things that they achieved by faith. But then the writer tells us something amazing in Hebrews 11:39. All these were approved through their faith but they did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, so that they would not be made perfect without us. Therefore, since we, and now he gets personal, applying all the, the lessons of faith as we look at the, the history of the scriptures, he now applies it to ourselves in chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. The race that God has given to each one of us to run. How do we do that? Keeping our eyes on the heroes of the past. No, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. David's faith in God, according to Hebrews, was ultimately based on the better promises of God, which are perfectly and finally fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so as we look at what this passage teaches us about faith, we are being urged to get rid of, of whatever it is that is hindering our faith. Those ongoing and deep-seated sins which are entangling us and, and keeping us from running the race with endurance. And we are called to focus our lives on Jesus Christ, who is the source of our faith, who is the object of our faith, and who is ultimately the completion of our faith, so that he will receive all the glory. Well, I pray that God's word will greatly encourage you today to become a man or a woman or a, a boy or a girl of faith in this God of the Bible, this God of, of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfecter, uh, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Lord God, we want to thank you today for this wonderful portion of your word. Lord, we know that for so many 
years, this portion of scripture has been distorted to, to cause us to take our eyes off you and to focus on David. But we thank you today for this clear pointer from David himself back to you that, that he was all about you. He was all about faith in you. And so we too need to live our lives with faith in the same God of David, the same Lord and Savior of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we want to thank you that you have walked the road before us. You have completed the race. You are now seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty, waiting for all your enemies to be made your footstool, of which this account of, of Goliath and the Philistine army is just a shadow. We look forward to that day when you will return as the ultimate victor, as King David's greater, greater, far greater son, the perfect God-man to redeem all of creation, to put to eternal separation and judgment all those who stand against you and to welcome for all eternity into your presence those who are united to you by faith. And so, Lord Jesus, we, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are right here with us, even now in the midst of everything that we are facing. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you today, for we pray this in your name and for your glory and for our good. Amen. Well, we're going to end our time this morning by singing that wonderful hymn uh, from Keith and Kristen Getty, By Faith We See the Hand of God, and that lovely chorus, We Will Stand as Children of the Promise. We will keep our eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. May that be the, uh, the real call of your heart this morning as we end our service uh, with this song. May the Lord bless you in this week ahead. Amen.